Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Milena Ratajczak. I'm a member of the hosting committee. Uh, and together with Nabila Aganim, we will be co-chairing this session. We have four talks planned for this afternoon. There's going to be one plenary talk and three talks uh, related to Merak prices. And it's my great pleasure to invite on stage the first speaker of this session, Monika Mościbrodska from Radboud University. And Monika is a part of the Even Horizon telescope team who contributed to the direct images of black holes. And uh, she's also the main person responsible for the polarimetric, polarimetric image of M87 ring. Monika was awarded with many, uh, many prizes, including individual 2023 Royal Astronomical Society Eddington Medal for her leading role in the imaging and modeling of the black holes, as well as the 2022 Dutch Research Council Athena Prize. Monika, the stage is yours. Um. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I hope uh, everybody is enjoying this conference in my uh, home country. Uh, so today uh, I want to talk about uh, theory, uh, when theory meets reality. In other words, when theories like me meets a bunch of observers and what comes out from this. Uh, so this uh, talk will be about uh, black holes, uh, accretion, and jets. And, uh, of course, I will be focused mostly on supermassive black holes that we can now uh, see with the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, but uh, hopefully some part of this uh, science, this discoveries, also applies to all other accreting black holes out there in the universe. Uh, in X-ray binaries, maybe in uh, gamma ray bursts. Not everything probably you can uh, transfer to these other sources, but hopefully some of it. And uh, at this point, I would like to also acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have done this, all this work without them, uh, especially young uh, PhD students and, and postdocs, uh, but also many, many other people inside of the Event Horizon Telescope uh, collaboration and outside of it. Uh, okay, so when I was a student, <laughs> I was always told that uh, black holes are the easiest objects in the U uh, that we can model. You know, they are like elementary particles. Uh, they can be described by, you know, my, maybe three numbers, mass, maybe spin, and maybe charge. Uh, but in astrophysics, it's usually just a mass and spin. Uh, I'm not sure if they are the simplest objects to model, but uh, when we think about black holes, we usually have this uh, metric in our heads and this kind of picture. Uh, so this is the Schwarzschild metric uh, that describes uh, space-times around uh, mass that is concentrated into one single point. Uh, this point is a singular, it's called singularity. Uh, and uh, the singularity is uh, um, um, hidden behind uh, this uh, surface called event horizon of a black hole. Uh, and uh, once you cross this event horizon, basically uh, you cannot turn uh, back and get out. Uh, it's even worse. Once you get in, inside of this region, uh, you cannot even turn around. You are basically doomed uh, to fall uh, onto singularity and you basically become a singularity. Uh, so the size of this uh, event horizon is uh, given by the so-called Schwarzschild radius. Uh, and Schwarzschild radius is just a function of uh, uh, black hole mass. So the more massive black hole, the bigger this uh, event horizon is. Uh, so this uh, solution to Einstein equations has been found by Schwarzschild, of course everybody knows it, uh, more than 100 years ago. At that time, uh, probably nobody thought about this uh, object, so this kind of metrics, there was, uh, the term black hole came much later. Uh, people didn't think about this as a real uh, object, they were only concepts. Uh, only 50 years later, uh, we start discovering uh, quasars, uh, blazars, X-ray astronomy came online and uh, uh, we started seeing you know, X-ray binaries and only that, then they became, became a reality. And people like Penrose suggested that uh, maybe black holes are, uh, you know, uh, must be seen as a natural process um, in a development on, on, on the universe. And, 
Uh, of course, he got uh, awarded a Nobel Prize uh, in physics for this in 2020, so quite recently. Uh, and, you know, today we have so many, <laughs> almost like real detections of black holes, you know, all the gravitational wave uh, uh, discoveries. And uh, recently, even two weeks ago, we had this brand, news, uh, brand new uh, information from the pulsar timing arrays. We have now an, uh, like a real evidence uh, that uh, black holes uh, uh, do exist out there. And probably, uh, you know, via feedback, uh, the evolution of the whole entire universe uh, is somehow connected uh, to the black holes. We don't understand it uh, exactly how, uh, but uh, probably black holes and uh, accretion and uh, black hole feedback is the key to understand uh, the universe, or at least one of the most important keys. Uh, and uh, there's also this uh, supermassive black hole object in the center of our own galaxy. Um, I'm sure I don't have to explain to you what's on this picture. You have heard about it uh, yesterday at the plenary talk. Uh, these are stars around the Sagittarius A star. Uh, uh, that is basically uh, four billion, million solar masses heavy. Uh, but uh, apart from stars in the galactic center region, there is also uh, a lot of gas. Uh, so this black hole or this supermassive black hole should manifest itself uh, as well via this accretion. And uh, indeed, we, we see this accretion process. Uh, we've been observing Sagittarius A star uh, now for 50 years uh, in radio band, uh, in, for about 30 years in near infrared, and also for about 20 years uh, in X-rays and gamma rays. So we have a lot of information um, uh, about this uh, source. Uh, by now, uh, do we uh, understand it? Uh, not yet, I would say, but we are getting close to actually understand uh, what's going on around it. Um, so when we talk, uh, when, when we think about the accretion, uh, we have this kind of picture in our, in our minds. Yeah, I'm showing this picture to my student in my course about black holes and accretion. Uh, so there are many different modes of accretion depending on what kind of source you're talking about. If you have, if the black hole is luminous, then maybe the accretion proceeds in form of these thin disks. But Sagittarius A star is actually very low luminosity. It's so-called low luminosity AGN. And uh, the accretion, uh, uh, we imagine that it looks more or less like in this lower uh, panel here. Uh, so there's maybe some thin disk there, but the inner parts of accretion, it's puffed. Uh, this is so-called advection-dominated accretion flow or, or RIAF, radiatively inefficient accretion flow. Uh, so uh, this is the I main idea uh, about this uh, source or this type of source uh, or any type of sub, uh, ed strongly sub-Eddington accreting black hole. Uh, the key ingredient of this uh, accretion model is the is, um, are the magnetic fields. Of course, our knowledge about these magnetic fields is a little bit rudimentary at the moment, but uh, the main idea is that uh, magnetic fields are very, very important. And this has been recognized back in the 90s by Barbus and Holly, uh, who proposed that uh, magnetorotational instability is the key uh, you know, uh, a major ingredient that drives the accretion. So uh, all you need here is some kind of magnetic field that are not too strong, so you can bend them easily, and some kind of uh, rotation, and this will naturally lead to a turbulence and uh, uh, this kind of uh, accre accretion process, basically. Um, so this, is the, this was the um, theoretical picture, and these days, in the last, um, let's say, a decade or two, uh, this has been a tremendous development in so-called numerical astrophysics. We can now uh, simulate this kind of accretion disk almost from first principles. Uh, this is all done in three dimensions, uh, with full magnetic fields included. It's all in full GR. Um, so we can uh, basically uh, build uh, like a more detailed models uh, uh, of these uh, accretion flows. So in this picture here, unfortunately I don't have a movie because <laughs> I had some problems when uploading this, this talk, so I will just show you in the pictures. So this picture basically shows you so-called standard and normal evolution accretion disk, so-called SANE. In our community we call this kind of uh, disk SANES. Uh, so this is this puffy disk uh, where angular momentum uh, uh, transport uh, is um, 
possible due to turbulence that is driven by this magnetorotational instability. Uh, this kind of disks are uh, nearly Keplerian. Uh, they also produce jets here above the black hole uh, polar regions. Uh, and uh, this picture, it's like a, you know, it's like a standard picture of accretion, right? You have, you have this fluffy disk, basically, uh, with some turbulent magnetic fields. But the question is, is this idea really realized uh, in nature? <laughs> uh, you can also start your simulations with slightly stronger magnetic fields. Uh, and um, uh, basically uh, obtain completely different solutions. So this type of solutions are called uh, magnetically arrested disks, uh, or in other words, uh, MADs. Um, and uh, in these models, uh, magnetic fields are more organized, basically. And the funny thing is that even in the GRMHD community, in the numerical astrophysics community, it's not fully agreed yet upon what exactly is the um, uh, uh, me main mechanism uh, here uh, needed to, to uh, get rid of this excess angular momentum that will help the matter to fall onto the horizon. For sure, MRI is uh, some part of it, but uh, uh, I think we still don't understand what is, uh, is this a leading role or not. There are many other uh, uh, mechanisms uh, playing, uh, in, a, in play here. Uh, so th there is still a debate uh, about, you know, uh, uh, we don't understand them, uh, this kind of models, uh, fully yet. What we do agree upon is that in the community is that definitely this kind of disks are sub-Keplerian. They are like 50% uh, Keplerianity. Uh, and the other thing is that um, uh, here uh, there is a very uh, strong magnetosphere uh, that produces a lot of uh, reconnections uh, uh, in this kind of flow. So this uh, kind of uh, models of accretion are very dynamic and a lot of different forces play against each other and uh, basically it's, it's more, more dynamic. Uh, so one thing uh, is uh, because of these magnetic reconnections and a, a strong magnetosphere, magnetosphere because there's a lot of magnetic fields accumulated on the horizon here, uh, we see that disks uh, are not nice and smooth, but they are very often disrupted. Uh, we, we start seeing this kind of hot bubbles uh, being created in the disk. This is basically a magnetosphere squeezing the disk uh, from both sides, and, and uh, finally the disk is very inhomogeneous in nature. Uh, this kind, in this kind of models, uh, there is also, uh, we know that there's a, ver a very strong jet being produced here. Uh, this jet is a little bit uh, different than uh, jet produced in this classic model, SANE models. This, uh, jets are much stronger, uh, basically, and they have a, a much wider opening angle. Okay, so these are the simulations, um, and uh, thanks to a small group of people who work on, you know, this, uh, creating algorithms and writing codes, <laughs> Uh, we have now also, also, we can turn these models into some testable predictions. We can actually now confront this, uh, this uh, modeling with the observations. Uh, so how these models look like to external observers is shown in this uh, plot. So this is from my paper almost 10 years ago, written almost 10 years ago. So the, how, how these models appear? Uh, well, it depends on the frequency, right, or wavelength you're observing. So uh, at the lo uh, uh, long waves, you only see some uh, synchrotron photosphere, uh, mainly from some outer uh, regions. And once you go uh, to higher frequencies or shorter wavelengths, uh, the plasma starts being uh, 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 more optically seen, and finally you can see the very core uh, of your accretion system, which is the black hole itself. Uh, so here, uh, at this particular frequency, uh, you, see, you start seeing uh, the, the shadow of the black hole. So the uh, black hole shadow, it's not exactly as large as the Schwarzschild radius. It's uh, about square root of 27 larger. Uh, then the Schwarzschild radius, this is because uh, black holes are like magnifying glasses and they are very strange magnifying glasses. Uh, they magnify themselves. So the shadow of the black hole, the shadow of the event horizon it appears larger um, than uh, it is actually. Uh, in this kind, of this kind of pictures, you also see a lensed image of the accretion disk. 
uh, and a lot of photon rings. So, you know, photons can circle around the black hole many, many, many times until they reach the observers, and this manifests as, as, as those rings. And any type of the asymmetry in this kind of images is produced by the uh, strong Doppler boosting effect. Um, this plasma, you know, it's very close to the event horizon. It's rotating around there with almost the speed of light, <laughs> or a good fraction of it. So you see a lot of Doppler boosting. So sometimes you see very inhomogeneous flow uh, boosted to one side. Uh, so one uh, important thing to mention about this ADAFs or RIAF type of accretion flows is, uh, is the, this, this is collisionless plasma. This is a part that we still don't understand fully, but this kind of accretion flows can be two temperature, uh, where electrons that shine have a different temperatures than ions that are more heavy and control the dynamics of the accretion flow. Uh, so you can actually assume something about this two temperature character of the accretion flow and uh, uh, highlight different parts of, of, uh, of a model. So this is something that we realized back in 2013 and 2014, that having a single MHD simulation of your accretion disk, you can produce basically a zoo of images, uh, uh, depending on how do you want to highlight uh, your two-temperature plasma. And uh, here we realize something important, uh, that, you know, um, the black hole shadow, uh, it's not always so visible, right? Depending on what uh, you assume, uh, sometimes it, it may be more obscured, <laughs> yeah? Uh, and of course, uh, your uh, appearance of a black hole and accretion flow will also depend on uh, view of viewing angle. So the geometry uh, here matters a lot. Uh, and uh, basically, this is my small uh, zoo of models that I have produced uh, in 2014. Uh, having one single model, you can actually have a zoo of possible, uh, you know, image templates now. Um, Okay, so this is, uh, here I'm showing you uh, intensity maps, but this is all synchrotron emission. You know, it's a hot plasma, relativistic, with magnetic field. This is synchrotron emission, and this emission is polarized. So we can now also produce this kind of images in full polarization, in all Stokes parameters, and again, uh, it's not just my work, there's uh, also other people uh, like Jason Dexter and Charles Gami uh, and many other people have created this uh, software to produce this kind of uh, observables, um, uh, you know, in full polarization, in full GR, all uh, effects are here included. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a tremendous work, basically, that somebody really thought about this to calculate this correctly. And then, depending on the model, whether it's a sane, standard model, or mad model, all these images uh, may, uh, may look different. Um, so here, just a few other examples. So now, you may say, okay, you have these models, and then you have this uh, produced bunch of observables. You can just simply compare it to observations and tell us you know, what the solution is, what's going on in Galactic Center and, you know, all other low luminosity AGN. But that's not so simple. First of all, the first problem is that especially Sagittarius A star, it's variable. <laughs> it changes on time scales of minutes. And then on the other hand, the models are also variable. So, you know, it's very difficult to compare something variable to some to, to model that is, is variable. The other problem, uh, you know, polarization uh, is very, it's a key actually here to distinguish the models, uh, but polarization is affected not only uh, by intrinsic variability of the sources, but also by the Faraday screens. Uh, there's a lot of Faraday rotation going on in the sources, um, uh, internally and externally, so. You know, here just a few examples how these polarimetric uh, images from different uh, models look like, and they basically change depending on <laughs> what time uh, you choose. Uh, you choose. Uh, so, um, yeah, so here, uh, you know, the Faraday effect. Uh, Faraday effect is the rotation of the polarization angle uh, as, as the light is passing through uh, magnetic, magnetized plasma. This is the eff effect um, uh, discovered by Lord Faraday uh, 200 years ago. Uh, I think this, uh, Faraday uh, himself would be very surprised to see what his effects are used for uh, interpretation of uh, images of black holes. 
so he, here are the images. Of course, there are many, many different observations of black holes, accreting black holes, but today, uh, these observations by the Event Horizon Telescope are probably the most constraining ones uh, for the models and for the theory. Uh, so on the, here you can see the M87, of course, the M87 uh, ring and the Sagittarius A star ring. So I'm not going to go into details exactly how these images were uh, obtained. Uh, I leave these details uh, for tomorrow. There will be a plenary talk by Professor Zenzus. He will tell you a little bit more about the developments in radio astronomy. Uh, what for me is striking about these images is that the sizes of these rings are fully consistent with what's expected uh, from the theory. Basically, the size of each ring, this is 40 microarcseconds, this is about 50 microarcseconds, is the size of the uh, expected size of the shadow of the black hole, as predicted from the GR. Uh, so this uh, image of M87, this has been published in 2019. I had the great pleasure to announce this, uh, this uh, amazing results. Uh, and this one was uh, published uh, just last year. Uh, I'm sure you have all seen this. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we have also published this image of a black hole. So this is a polarimetric image uh, of M87 black hole. So um, on the top of the total intensity, we have also information about uh, polarization structure along the ring. So this pol linear polarization basically tells you something about what is the orientation of magnetic fields on the ring. Uh, so I, I just wanted here to acknowledge the group uh, of people that have been working on this, uh, basically in the middle of the pandemic. So most of the data analysis happens uh, just before the pandemics, and then uh, the rest was uh, during the pandemics, and we wrote uh, this uh, two papers on this, basically uh, observational paper and also theory paper uh, in the middle of the pandemics, basically sitting uh, in the, our little prisons at homes. Uh, so, uh, this uh, image, in my opinion, is uh, super constraining. It's way more constraining than total intensity images for, for the theory. Okay, so now uh, the next few slides, uh, I want to say something about the work done by the theory working group in the uh, Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. So, you know, I, this is impossible to do by one person or one group even. So, what has this collaboration done? Uh, we have run a lot of different simulations of accreting black holes, uh, SANE simulation, the standard uh, uh, fluffy disk simulations, and also magnetically arrested disks simulation, and, and for Sagittarius A star, we also consider some alternative scenarios, and uh, the, our goal was to compare these models in a systematic way to the observations. What is uh, 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 remarkable about this uh, is that um, this was not run by one group or using one code, uh, these models are run by at least three different codes that are developed independently and by many groups, definitely more than four groups uh, that are working uh, independently. So all the results that I will show you here are very, very well vetted, <laughs> okay? And uh, this is just a great example, you know, of, of how much work can be done in collaboration rather than separately. I don't think that we uh, soon will be able to repeat this exercise again, okay? Okay, so here is the comparison. Uh, it's a very, you know, very summary plot of a comparison of all these uh, um, uh, models to the uh, observations. So observation here uh, is shown here. And this is one of the images that we have, just it's a model based on GRMHD simulation. So uh, just uh, look how close we get to these observations, okay? It turned out that if you do this uh, observation, that the most of the models that are similar to the observations are uh, the magnetically arrested disk. So this data, of course, this is M87 data, not Sagittarius A star. Uh, but, you know, uh, here uh, there are a few passing uh, standard accretion models, but uh, if you take into account also the fact that M87 has this very powerful jet, uh, these models, you know, are also ruled out. So it seems that uh, M87 is accreting, which is also a low luminosity AGN, very similar to Sagittarius A star, uh, it's uh, accreting in this mad mode, okay? It's magnetically arrested disks. And because uh, we know from modeling uh, that there is an extraction of energy from the black hole via this Blanford's Nyack process, 
uh, this uh, image is currently the strongest evidence uh, that this energy extraction actually does really operate in reality, okay? All other <laughs> observations are just pure speculations. So this is uh, uh, our, um, you know, idea that this is a signature of the blandford znajek effect. Uh, how to interpret this image? Well, this is uh, this kind of pattern of polarization can be only produced if you have a strong, magnet, strong vertical magnetic field component on a black hole. And uh, as you can see, in terms of frac polarization fractions, this ring is quite depolarized. Part of it is even totally depolarized. And again, how, well, how to explain this? This is again Faraday. So the, our current interpretation is that this depolarization is due to internal Faraday rotation. Again, effect discovered 200 years ago. What about Sagittarius A star? We have, of course, a whole zoo of models for Sagittarius A star uh, created in, a, uh, in the same manner as for M87. So here I'm showing you just a selection of the models. Uh, taken from the theory working group of EHT. Uh, for uh, Sagittarius A star, we unfortunately don't have yet the polarimetric image, so we can only uh, compare it to total intensity maps. Uh, but uh, for uh, Sagittarius A star, you know, we observe it for so many years. We have a lot of other data, multi wavelength spectrum. If you take that into account, uh, you can actually uh, rule out many, many of these solutions. So, for example, if you take into account just the size and the shape, of the EHT uh, image, these are the models that are left. By the way, I forgot to say that the top ones are the mud ones and the bottom ones are the uh, standard accretion models. Uh, if you take into account spectral information, uh, you end up with the four models. And then if you take into account the size of Sagittarius A star at three millimeter, you only uh, left with these two models. And it turned out that these are, again, magnetically arrested disks. Uh, recently, we have also uh, found another evidence that Sagittarius A star is also accreting in this MAD mode. Uh, we see this in uh, ALMA data. This is not EHT observation, but ALMA data. If you look at the uh, ALMA polarimetry from Sagittarius A star, Sagittarius A, uh, behaves uh, sometimes very oddly. Uh, it shows this kind of loops in a QU plane. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a movie here because my movies don't work. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, it goes like this. It, it's a big loop and a small loop and, and a big loop again. So this kind of behavior in a, in a polarimetry plane uh, it has been detected previously in millimeter uh, using SMA telescope, but also this is also seen in gravity. So with ALMA in millimeter range in the same frequency as EHT, we see the source doing um, this kind of QU loops. How to explain this? This kind, of, um, this kind of behavior can be very easily explained by a very simple model of a hot spot uh, inside, uh, embedded in some kind of accretion disk. So this is uh, the gray points here are the ALMA data and you can see uh, how a simple model of a hotspot threaded by vertical magnetic field uh, fits this uh, uh, observational data. It's, it's incredible how good this fit is given the simplicity of this model. Uh, so this is uh, the work, this is led by Maciek Wielgus and also now um, by one of my students is doing the fitting. It's incredible, but the thing is that this kind of hotspots are very often produced, again, in magnetically arrested disks. Uh, here you have an example of it. So this is, again, completely uh, EHT-independent evidence that um, uh, Sagittarius A star is also, you know, accreting in a mad, mad, uh, mad uh, magnetically arrested mode. So... <laughs> I don't want to make any uh, uh, hypothesis here, but maybe it's a good moment to think about accretion. Perhaps it's not smooth and fluffy and nice MRI-driven disks. Maybe it's more dynamic. Maybe it's this mad. Maybe we live in this mad, mad, mad world. Uh, so this is a, a poster from very old and very funny comedy uh, uh, that I recommend to see, but the title of this movie really fits my, <laughs> the conclusion of my, of my talk. Maybe we do live in a mad uh, uh, world. And finally, I wanted to say, uh, you know, are the theories done here? You know, we have this amazing observation, we have all these models, are we done? 
so the simple uh, answer is no, <laughs> we're not done yet. There is uh, still a lot of um, you know, problems that we have to solve. Uh, I don't want to list them on my slides because I would like to end on positive note, uh, but we still don't understand the variability of the sources. Uh, we still don't understand exactly models. Uh, the ADAPs are made of collisionless plasma, which we don't understand how this works on micro scales. Um, uh, we don't, still don't understand how exactly jets works and, you know, how uh, particles are being accelerated in jets. We still don't understand exactly why Sagittarius A star is flaring and we still don't know if M87 is flaring or not. I mean, it should if, if it's driven by mud accretion. So there is still, this is a message to the younger generation. Uh, if you think that, you know, we're done with imaging, <laughs> We have images of black holes. We, are we done? No, we're still making them new ones. We have a lot of more data coming, uh, and there's a still a lot of a lot of to do uh, in theory. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Monica, for presenting these exciting results. And your role was was really uh, enormous. So congratulations on that. Uh, we have a time uh, for one short question and one. I cannot see. Well. Thank you, Monica, for the great presentation. I had a question concerning the so the time scale of integration to get to produce an image is, is of the order of the day. Do we have any hope to be able to resolve the dynamics of uh, of Sagittarius A star, for instance, on uh, on much shorter time scale three imaging? Yes, that's the, actually the next goal of EHT. We want to make movies. We have capability, but this is a very difficult problem, actually, to make a movie of a black hole. Yeah, but that definitely this is something that will come for Sagittarius A star in the next few years, for sure. Thank you very much. Our time is running out, so let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Hello everybody, so uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, take over and uh, continue this uh, plenary session with a series of three presentations from young researchers, uh, early career researchers that were uh, awarded the Merak Prize for the uh, uh, best early career research. Uh, so this prize is a prize that is uh, uh, provided by the uh, Merak Foundation who was represented by Lucho Mayor here sitting here with me. And uh, in uh, the context of a collaboration between the EAS and the Merak Foundation, uh, I have the pleasure and the honor to uh, chair the uh, prize committee uh, that has um, evaluated excellent numerous uh, nominations for early careers uh, researchers this year. Uh, however, I would uh, take the opportunity of being here <laughs> on the stage to, uh, 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 to ask for even more nominations. I hope that many of you have attended the uh, MERAC uh, session uh, where the uh, MERAC awardees of the past 10 years, this was the 10th anniversary of the MERAC Foundation, they've presented their work and they've presented the impact of the MERAC Prize on their careers, on their projects. Uh, it's a really outstanding uh, manner of boosting the careers and the project of, the, of young researchers. So I encourage everybody uh, to nominate uh, young early research careers this year, the nomination will be for uh, best PhDs. So think about it. Think of your PhDs, think of your collaborators, think of your colleagues, and, and please nominate them. As of today, uh, we are going to have and to hear uh, three presentations from the uh, three outstanding uh, nominations that we have uh, uh, identified during our evaluation. And uh, the first one is uh, provided to uh, the, the prize for the um, best early career in theory, uh, for uh, Manuel Arca Sedda, who I invite to uh, come to the stage and to receive his certificate from the hands of Lucho Mayor. So, dear Manuel Arca Sedda, it's really a pleasure to award you the Merak Prize 2023 in theoretical astrophysics for pioneering research in the dynamics of compact objects as gravitational wave sources in galactic nuclei and dense star clusters. Thanks. Congratulations. Thanks. 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 <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
it's, uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here, and thanks again for selecting me, and thank you for being here today. So, I am Manuel Elbi, talking about intermediate mass black holes today, but first, please, let me just, yes, um, thanks. Uh, again, EOS and Merak, and Merak Foundation for this, this honor and this prize, and my family, Martina, Valerio, and Federico for their endless support, and all the friends and collaborators and mentors that really helped me to build up my academic training. Um, I want to thank also the European Union for funding my research project, Grace Black Hole, which is ongoing. And last but not least, I want to thank the organization of this amazing uh, conference and particularly TILAC that helped me to ensure that this presentation was going to work today, so hopefully. Okay, so let's go back to science. We are going to talk about IMBHs, as I said, what we do and don't know, and uh, whether we can find a way to form them, especially in dense stellar system. So, so far we are used to categorize black holes at least in two main categories. Sterile black holes, which come from the death of massive stars and have masses generally be below 100 solar masses, and supermassive black holes, which we know reside in the center of galaxies, and as we have heard in the beautiful talk before, we now are able to imagine at least the gas swirling around them. And we think that in the middle, we have kind of a missing link that we call intermediate mass black holes. So this is a, an a landscape unexplored in the range, let's say, a few hundred till tens of thousands solar masses. We have evidence, observational evidence, of heavy IMBHs as ma with masses above 50,000 solar masses in the center of low mass galaxies and dwarf galaxies. And there are many different observational techniques that can be used to pinpoint these objects. But what about smaller um, sizes as masses for IMBHs? We have evidence of a few candidates in star clusters, and especially in Milky Way globulars, there are some candidates, but in the vast majority of the cases, these candidates with putative masses in between 1,000 and 10,000 square masses are really controversial and uh, widely and wildly debated sometimes. So at the moment, we have no smoking gun yet for IMBHs in the typical range of masses between 1,000 and uh, a few tens of thousands of masses. Um, last year, we had uh, the first uh, beautiful um, observation of a, a black hole right inside the lower limit that we usually set for IMBHs, a 150 solar mass black hole formed out of the merger between two stellar mass black holes that detected through their gravitational wave emission from the ligo virgo and Kagra collaboration. So then we have this one nice black hole right inside the IMBH uh, mass range, and then we have these low, heavy IMBHs in the center of dwarf galaxies. And a natural question that may arise is whether actually IMBHs do really constitute a category of black holes per se, or rather what is, in, what is in this unexplored landscape are just black holes that belong to the high hand of the stellar mass black hole distribution, mass distribution and to the low end of the supermassive black hole mass distribution. So which one is true? Um, from the observational standpoint, in the future, there may be many, many new experiments that can help unraveling the mystery of IMBHs. And among them, gravitational wave detectors can play a key role. And as you may know, whenever you have two objects paired together that orbit about each other, they'll be emitting gravitational waves. And the point is that, depending on the mass of the binary, the frequency, the typical frequency of the emitted gravitational wave, will change. And in fact, if you go from the heaviest black hole to the smallest one, the frequency of the emitted gravitational waves will span 10 order of magnitudes. This means that to observe different sources, you need different detectors. 
And that's also why the LIGO Virgo and CAGRA collaboration cannot provide us with, imagine, with, with observations of IMBHs in the 1,000 and 10,000 solar mass uh, scale. And this is also shown in this nice plot from Moore et al. 2014, where we have the signal coming from different type of sources, massive binaries and stellar mass black holes, overlaid to the sensitivity curves of many, many different detectors. And just to highlight some of them, I put here a timeline with future detectors. And in each panel, what we see is the maximum, what we call the reach of a detector, or the horizon redshift. It is the maximum redshift at which we can observe um, an object of a given mass on the x-axis. Different curves here correspond to different value of the mass of the companion orbiting about the IMBH. And I want to just highlight the role of LISA and Einstein telescope, which may be able to complement each other and provide observations of IMBHs with masses right inside this thousand, tens of thousands of masses range, up to redshift of a few, up to redshift 10. So hopefully, gravitational wave detectors may give us a final answer about the nature of IMBHs, at least in concert with other observational techniques. From the theoretical standpoint, one, uh, to, to, to find out whether IMBHs are really a black hole category or not, we should find at least one or a few physical processes which are capable of building up these objects all across the desired mass range. And among many different uh, models and theories, one is that IMBHs can develop in dense stellar environments. Why? Because star clusters, dense stellar environment, dense galactic nuclei, represent uh, ideal laboratories where many different uh, physical processes processes are at play simultaneously. We typically have a collection of stars. The most massive one will segregate into the center, and some of them will turn into black holes. So we have mass segregation. We have dynamical friction. We have stellar evolution. And as these massive objects segregate in the center, the cluster density will rise up till a point which is called core collapse, where practically the density reaches a maximum and this corresponds to the maximum probability for interaction, for strong interactions to occur and to favor the formation of binaries and tight multiples. So this is the moment where tight binaries can form and perhaps uh, stellar mergers can occur or black hole, black hole mergers can occur. And after that, there is uh, the, the, the newly formed multiples in the cluster center will inject energy onto the cluster in the regions the core will rebound, and we have an expanding phase of the cluster during which occasionally the central compact objects can be ejected in strong interactions. And to give you a, an even more in, um, glimpse of how important can be interactions in star clusters, I'm showing here an example. We have a binary, black and uh, red, and a single object in blue, and we are going to see what happens in a binary single interaction. So you see that this is a pretty uh, complex and chaotic process. And what is the bottom line of that is that during these exchanges, occasionally and temporarily, you can form new and new and new binaries, which are tighter and tighter and tighter. And on, the, on your right side, I'm showing the separation between the two most bound objects in the triple. And now, if you interpret these three particles as black holes, the bottom line is, is that after a few years and many interactions, there will be a final binary left. And this final binary will have orbital properties completely different from the initial uh, conditions. In fact, if you measure the time that gravitational waves take for the binary to merge, it is just 250 years. It is like four or five of the magnitudes smaller than at the beginning. If you instead interpret these three points as stars, as you can see here, the continuous interactions at some point bring the particles within a ring, within a separation which is smaller than the sum of the radii, meaning that this kind of interactions, which can involve also stars, can trigger star mergers. And 
One example, one practical example of how interactions can be crucial in interpreting something we observe is given in this, um, this small project I pursued after Ligon Virgen Cagra discovered this nice source called GW1908.14, which was a kind of mystery because it was involving a normal black hole and uh, a secondary object which is too heavy to be a neutron star, too light to be a black hole. And uh, in this series of, <clears throat> um, well, in this series of work, we have, uh, have shown that if you allow a tiny fraction of such uh, mysterious objects to form in a normal stellar population, and then you plug into a, a star cluster, and you allow a simple binary with a black hole and a star, black and red, and you put them on a course uh, with, uh, and meet with a roaming neutron star, the interaction can lead to this triple phase that you see in the movie, which uh, we are zooming in over time, uh, which eventually leads to a more and more and more chaotic phase, um, at the end of which the star is actually ejected, and a newly formed binary here is highly eccentric and sufficiently small to merge within the cluster within an able time and well before any other uh, perturber can come in and disrupt or perturb again the binary. Okay, so then, as we have said, star clusters may be laboratories where study the formation of MBHs and we need to find some <clears throat> processes that can be um, sufficiently efficient for MBHs to form and grow. And among many, other, many, many processes, we are going to talk about four of them, for which we have a lot of uncertainties. Nevertheless, they are very interesting. One of them is stellar collisions. You have stars, interactions, star merges, um, and, and, um, and the remnant of the star eventually collapses to an IMBH. We have uh, the possibility of such massive stars to interact with stellar mass black holes. And in star black hole interactions, some of the stellar material is accreted onto the black hole till the point that the black hole becomes an IMBH. And we have uh, what we call hierarchical black hole mergers. You have two black holes in the cluster, they pair together, they merge, and the remnant is retained somehow in the cluster, pairs up again with another black hole, merge again and again and again, building up a chain <coughs> like this. Um, and this is a process we have been investigating in this work with Paul Marisuan and Tian Shen a couple of years ago. And last but not least, there is this secular process in which you have a black hole, we have a system where black holes are, have been mostly evacuated from the environment. You have a couple of them and occasionally stars just fall in and are disrupted during a tidal disruption, partial tidal disruption event and slowly build up the black hole mass. Our contribution, our latest contribution to this debate uh, has been by running a suite of embodied simulations um, that represent star clusters with up to one million stars, with up to 33% 30 per, of them initially paired in binaries at when initial densities up to 10 to the 7 solar mass per cubic parsec. And the results of these simulations appeared today on the archive. So if you want to see details about them, please check them out. Um, the idea here was to have uh, models representing uh, young and mid-age star clusters that we observe all around us. And in fact, here you see um, the mass and half mass radius evolution of our models, in black lines, in comparison with um, clusters observed in the Magellanic Clouds, in M31, in the Milky Way. So at least we are sure we are not simulating anything too crazy, you know. We have a comparison with something that exists. Now, out of 19 simulations we've been running in the last couple of years, we have found eight IMBHs that form over the simulation time. And interestingly, this means uh, an efficiency in the formation of IMBHs of around 40%, which is fairly high. Um, and we found a, a, a weak correlation between uh, the value adopted for the half mass radius, the first row, the fraction of binaries initially adopted, 
and the number of black holes of IMBHs you form divided by the number of simulations we've been running for each category. So this is already an interesting thing. And in particular, going toward more compact clusters increases the probability for you to form an IMBH. One example of formation scenarios for our IMBH is the series of simulations we've been running is called Dragon 2. And in Dragon 2 simulations, IMBH is formed through different path. We are going to see them. One example is in Sketch Deer. We have initially a pair of stars, quite massive, and a perturber. And the interaction is so uh, efficient and so dramatic that actually the perturber merge with the companion in the binary. And then this happens again with another perturber. And at some point, the remnant of this stellar merger here inflate and merge with its companion. And eventually, the massive star that has formed collapses to a black hole. Then later, the IMBH actually collide, well, merge with, a, with another star. And in this case, we are assuming in the simulations that half of the mass of the star is accreted onto the black hole, although we know that this is a, a rather uncertain factor that need to be discussed. Another example of IMBH formation is a bit more complex. We have initially two binaries that lives, I mean, they live in the cluster well separated. They undergo different processes, and eventually, in one case, the one on your right side, uh, the stars merge and form a black hole, in the end, of almost 100 square masses. In the other case, instead, the two objects live more or less um, alone until one star becomes a black hole and the other one eventually fall onto the black hole. So at this point, we have two black holes with almost 100 mass each. And then these two black holes start interacting with other black holes, other stars, and eventually they find each other in the cluster center and eventually merge, forming a final black hole of 200 star masses, almost 200 star masses. So let's dissect how many um, pathways we can recognize for our MBHs in the simulations. First, stellar mergers. We found around 100 stellar mergers in the Dragon 2 simulations. Just two of them lead to a black hole with a mass above 100 solar masses. And in the plot, you see the formation time of these stellar mergers and the mass of the remnant for all the events we found which eventually become an IMBH in black, a normal stellar black hole in blue, or that undergo um, pair instability and pulsational pair instability supernovae event, and they are in red and white. So you see that the development of this explosive phenomena called P um, pulsational and pair instability supernovae can really limit your probability to form an IMBH in a star cluster. Then we have quite a huge amount of star black hole interactions, owing mostly to the fact that our binaries are perturbed by other stars. And so then it is easier for the newly formed black hole to receive some matter from their companion. And, but even in this case, actually, uh, just one of these events lead to the formation of a IMBH, actually has 107 solar masses, so it's just inside the range of IMBHs. And what you see in the plot here is the mass uh, on the x-axis, this is the distribution of masses of the black hole and star involved in this star-black hole interaction. These are in black and red. And then the open steps represent the mass spectrum of the newly formed black holes after this star-black hole interaction. And finally, we have uh, uh, the remaining five black holes, the remaining five IMBHs, all forming via black hole-black hole mergers. So they may be seen as uh, gravitational wave sources in principle. And here, what I'm showing is the mass of the primary, the mass ratio, and in colors, we um, are reporting explicitly the mass of the companion. And you see we have quite a bunch of uh, mergers around the 80s. Um, five of them leads to an IMBH with a mass <coughs> in between uh, 140 and 200 something, so our masses. We also found some exotic mergers here. 
two neutron star black hole and, three, and one black hole white dwarf merger, which are quite rare in star clusters, so we are pretty lucky to have them, and we wanted to have some discussion in the paper. This is from paper three, if you are interested in the details. So the first take home here is that with Dragon 2 simulations for the type of parameter space we have been investigating, we have found that IMBH can form relatively easily with masses below 500 solar masses through a combination of processes, star, mer star mergers, star black hole interactions, and black hole black hole mergers. Now, although our sample is relatively small, we try to find the connection between the cluster structure and the IMBH properties, and I think this is quite an interesting um, plot from paper uh, two, where we show the formation time of the IMBH on the x-axis, the mass of the IMBH, and colored the density of the host cluster at the beginning of the simulation. So you may see that uh, we found a kind of a threshold above 300,000 solar masses per cubic parsec, the cluster is sufficiently dense to enable and to favor stellar mergers which happen on a very short time scale, below 10 mega year. <clears throat> then the, rem the, the, the stars coming out of these mergers collapses to IMBHs, and the IMBHs are, in this case, the most massive in our sample. While sparser clusters do not manage to pu pull up together stars, but on longer time scales, they still are dense enough for black hole, black hole to merge together and form smaller IMBHs. So this is the take home two. We can form <coughs> IMBHs and the, the density of the host cluster at the beginning influences somehow the pathway through which the IMBH form and the final properties and formation time of the IMBH itself. Okay, now we have, for, we have formed the IMBH and the question is, can we grow it inside the cluster? Can it take the lead and grow farther and farther? Well, actually, there are two important processes that you need to keep in mind. One is purely Newtonian. Once you have your IMBH in the center of your cluster, it will be very likely that it takes, that it capt capture a companion. And the binary will surely undergo strong interactions with other black holes, which will be still there in the cluster. And after each interaction, will, which will become stronger and stronger, the binary will receive a recoil, a Newtonian recoil. And this recoil can easily exceed the um, escape velocity for the from the cluster. So even if you don't account for anything else but Newtonian gravity, it's extremely hard for you to retain the IMBH. More, more importantly, if your IMBH is coming out of the merger between two black holes, promptly after the merger, the remnant will, rec will receive a gravitational wave recoil owing to the asymmetry in the gravitational wave emission. And this kick uh, can be as high as 10,000 kilometers per second. So in this case, there is no chance for you to retain the IMBH in the type of clusters we've been uh, modeling. And in fact, in our simulations, none of the IMBHs remain in the cluster by the end of the simulation. So it's extremely hard for us to retain the IMBH and grow it further. They just escape and leave as eternal Peter Pan in the universe. So I'm concluding here with a few questions. Do IMBHs form in star clusters? Yes, yeah, they can, and they follow different processes. Stellar mergers, star black hole interactions, black hole, black hole mergers. It can happen frequently if you look in a certain region of the phase space, and the cluster structure may affect the properties of the IMBHs itself, themselves. Do they grow in star clusters? Well, it seems quite hard, and perhaps one should go toward the extreme uh, in an, an extreme portion of the parameter space, particularly dense and massive star clusters, maybe they can nurture the growth of IMBHs, but so far it seems quite hard, owing both to Newtonian and general relativistic effects. So, do IMBHs constitute a category of black holes per se? That remains an excellent question. Thank you, thank you again for the prize and thank you for attention. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for the uh, presentation. And uh, let's take uh, questions now. We have uh, some time. I think, I hope I can see people around uh, raising hands. Oh, good. 
<laughs> at least somebody sees it. <laughs> It's not working. Try again? T try again? Nope. Boo boo. Oh, Wait, now it's sorry. working. Now it's working. Fine, fine, fine. Not needed. So, uh, thank you, Manuel. Nice talk, Thanks. as usual. So, I have probably two nasty questions because I'm a collaborator in a paper, so I know where dirty tricks. Which yeah, you nasty use, nasty you questions are, are, are forbidden here. <laughs> Just so, nice questions. Yeah, 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 nice questions. Of course, nice. So, first one. Uh, most of the result we have for this one million body simulation, it's clear, but at some point maybe it's, we need to go farther, something like 2 million, 10 million, or whatever. So what we can expect for the larger cluster? Maybe the probability can be higher, or this retaining factor can be higher also. So it's, it's, a, it's a question. And the second, how about the external field? So, in our simulations, we use a pretty simple one. So, what you expect, what, what we can gain if you're using, let's say, the nuclear star cluster field or closer to a galactic center. So, what we can gain in this case uh, for the IMBH formation. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, about question one, yes, that is true. Our problem here is that we are still limited to this one million bodies and it would be great to go toward 10 millions or so because in that case, of course, the potential well will be much deeper, meaning that the escape velocity will be larger, and then it will be possible to retain the merger products of these uh, IMBH black hole mergers, or even better, the outcome of a Newtonian uh, binary single interaction. So I'm, um, there are many, actually in the last few years, uh, it was really a boom, of uh, semi-analytic models that try to model these black hole interactions in star clusters. And of course, in a semi-analytic tool, you can go up uh, in, the, in the cluster mass scale. So there are models of nuclear clusters. Um, I also did some. And we have shown, actually, that if you go beyond 10 to the 7 solar mass, you can, you have a fairly uh, good um, probability to form this um, heavy IMBH is up to thousands of solar masses. Now, the problem is that one question is whether nuclear cluster hosts or not a supermassive black hole. If a supermassive black hole is there, everything is much more complex. If there is some um, process that forms the IMBH first and then the IMBH will become a supermassive black hole, this is a completely different question. And so, well, about uh, the Tidal field you asked about, in our clusters, we were studying compact clusters that are inside their Roche, Roche lobes, so the impact of the galactic field is not that dramatic. But even though you include the, the tidal field, typically in these star clusters, the mass segregation time scale is sufficiently short for your stars to just sink in. And then I would imagine that while the tidal field will affect a lot the outskirts, of the clusters, the inner regions where black hole uh, interacts and grow together wouldn't be much affected. But, you know, we should try. Thanks. Uh, are there any other questions in the audience? Raise your hands. I'm not sure I see. Yeah, thank you, Thierry, there. Yeah, I, I have a naive question which is a bit outside of uh, your talk. Uh, and which is, in case, in the scenario when there is no population of intermediate black holes, what's uh, the process that's uh, put forward to grow um, a supermassive black hole if there are no intermediate black holes that they can grow for, from? So can you say again the last part? I didn't hear. In case there are no intermediate yes. black hole population uh, that a supermassive black hole can grow from, how people uh, explain them? Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm not sure whether... Um, the point is this. You can also... There are different scenarios for the formation of the low-mass supermassive black holes found in dwarf galaxies. And you can also suggest that these uh, heavy IMBHs or low-mass supermassive black holes form through dynamics. You can sustain it, and you can try it. And, in fact, there are some semi-analytic tools that predict 
um, the formation of, I think, 100,000 solar mass black holes in uh, the range of densities and sizes of dwarf galaxies. The question is, the question is now whether they should be called IMBHs or just supermassive black holes of low mass. This is a, I'm not sure whether it's taxonomy or, or it's theoretical astrophysics, you know. Thank you very much, Manuel. I Thanks. think that we uh, can thank Manuel again for his presentation. And it is now my pleasure to, uh, to have uh, Domenica Vielezelec here uh, on the stage. Uh, she has been awarded the uh, Merak Prize for the uh, Early Career Best Research in Observational uh, Astronomy, and she will receive her prize from YouTube. So the EAS is uh, very proud to award you the Merak Prize uh, 2023 in Observational Astrophysics for your pioneering work using state-of-the-art integral field unit instruments, in particular for the work demonstrating the impact of supermassive black holes on their host galaxies and the large-scale environment. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks to the EIS and to the Merak Foundation for this great honor of receiving this prize. Um, you will hear more about black holes in this talk. I hope you're um, you're not bored of them just yet. But before I start, I would like to acknowledge that the work that I've been involved in and that also led me to receiving this prize doesn't come by itself. I've had the great pleasure and the great luck of working with an amazing set of collaborators and um, supporters who have supported me throughout my career, starting from my PhD at ESO, then I'm moving on to my postdoctoral years, and now through amazing colleagues at the University of Heidelberg. In particular, I want to highlight and mention the work that is being done within our research group at the University of Heidelberg. Um, our research group is called Galina. Um, we are a, a growing young um, group of motivated young scientists um, and it's really them who are currently pushing the projects and are allowing us to do the work that, that we do. Um, I also want to say that in my case specifically, um, a network of a supporting family and friends is really crucial for enabling the work that we do. Um, I remember this one specific case last year where we got our first JWST data on a weekend, I think it was a Sunday even, and I was lucky to have the supporting network of a family who took care of the kids and went with them to a playground so I could you know, sit in peace and quiet and look at these amazing JWST data that came in. Um, so having said that, I would like to start my talk actually with this beautiful image of the first JWST deep field that came out exactly one year ago. Um, it's an unprecedented view of the early universe. It shows thousands and thousands of galaxies. Each little dot that you see in this image is a galaxy in the distant universe. But what's most relevant for my work and what drives my research is the fact that this image would probably look very different if it wasn't for supermassive black holes being hosted in most galaxies in the universe and for them to be taking an active part in galaxy evolution. So as we've heard um, and the previous talks beautifully um, set, the, set the stage, sometimes um, supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies go through active phases during which they actively accrete matter. This is when we call them AGN or active galactic nuclei. And the AGN phase is really a very energetic one. And even if just a tiny fraction that is released during the process of accretion couples to the gas in the galaxy, that can have a huge effect on the evolution of their host galaxies. So the term AGN feedback, which is also in the, um, the title of my talk, really refers to any processes, radiative and kinetic processes, that impact the evolution of um, the AGN host galaxies. We think we know already quite a bit about AGN feedback, and it's really 3D observations that have started to 
complement or to allow us to gain a more comprehensive view of how feedback establishes itself in galaxies across cosmic time. Um, so what do I mean by 3D observations? Well, think of a fly. Um, a fly, a fly's eyes is um, composed of thousands of tiny photoreceptors that allow the fly to get a comprehensive view of its surroundings, making it very, very hard to actually catch a fly. Integral field unit instruments that are providing us with 3D data somewhat work in a similar way. So the field of view is chopped into little segments and in each segment we get a spectrum and we get therefore a spectrum in every single pixel across the field of view of our 3D observation, allowing us to get a much more comprehensive view of a galaxy. So as an example, look at this galaxy here. This is um, a galaxy that probably hosts an active supermassive black hole was observed within the SDSS survey. This is a simple three color image. Um, and within the SDSS program, also spectrum was taken of this galaxy. The spectrum, or the uh, region the spectrum comes from, is a three arc second fiber that covers um, the size of the circle that is shown here on the galaxy. We can zoom in to the spectrum and look, for example, at the H alpha emission line to learn something about um, the gas in this galaxy. We can measure a line flux, we can measure um, kinematic signatures and try to infer something about this galaxy. But then this galaxy was also observed um, within an IFU program, within the Mangak program. And suddenly we um, get a much more nuanced picture of what's happening to the gas and what is um, happening in, uh, in this galaxy. So you can see how the H alpha flux is, is distributed across the galaxy. We um, can measure velocity fields in much, much greater detail than was possible before. And we can also look at the spatial um, variations of, for example, gas velocity dispersions to look for signs of outflows, of turbulence, of peculiarities in, um, this, in this gaseous galaxy. So 3D observations are really enabling us to get a much more complete picture of galaxies. And in particular, this is very helpful if you want to investigate what impact AGN have on host galaxies. But where and what should we actually point our IFU instruments towards to? And I think um, it's very helpful to take a step back and first look at uh, what we know about cosmic history. So on this slide, you see um, the evolution of the quasar space density. So quasars are the most luminous types of AGN that we observe in the universe. And it peaks somewhere between redshift one, between redshift one to three. This is also where the star formation rate density in the universe peaks. So this is where really most of the action in the universe um, is taking place or is happening. And both observations and simulations um, um, agree with that general pictures that probably black holes grow quickly in the early universe. They grow in size and mass until they become powerful enough to clear the environments, to drive outflows at this peak epoch of galaxy formation that we call cosmic noon, leaving behind dormant and quiescent black holes at low redshift. So you see, to understand feedback, we actually need to map and look at the entire cosmic history, which is not an easy thing to do, but it doesn't get, it gets even more difficult. Um, as we've heard, AGN are both sources of particles and photons, and AGN can look and be very different. So in some cases, the radiative output is very small, um, but the jet or the particle output is, is dominating, and there are other cases where we have high radiative output but low particle outputs. And that leads to the fact that we are observing different flavors of AGN um, in the universe. So in this most, one of the most extreme cases, we observe these classical radio galaxies where in the optical, you can nicely observe and see the host galaxy, but then you also observe these giant radio jets that are coming out of the system. In the other extreme case, um, the particle output may be small, but the radiative output 
um, dominates and the host galaxy, at least in the optical, uh, sorry, the AGN in the optical is completely overshining um, its host galaxy. And these are these typical blue quasars that you may have heard of. But then there is this whole parameter space in between and AGN are known to populate this, um, the, the space between the two extremes. Interestingly, there are also um, two extremes of two different feedback modes associated with those two extreme ends of this population. On the one hand, we observe um, a feedback mode that we call radio mode feedback, where we see these jets slamming into the ISM or CGM, heating up the gas and preventing further star formation from happening possibly. In quasars, we often observe um, what we call quasar mode type of feedback or wind mode feedback, where we see really galaxy-wide winds and outflows that are very powerful, that are fast moving gas, that in some cases may be even able to push out, to push gas outside of their host galaxies. But again, there is this whole parameter space in between and there are also AGN in which we observe a mix um, of these two feedback modes and um, both modes at the same time. Um, so coming back to our um, picture of cosmic evolution and how AGN and feedback may fit into, you see that we have to observe galaxies at different cosmic times, but we also have to look at different scales, at different gas phases to really understand and build up the picture how AGN may have contributed to, ga to galaxy evolution. Um, so luckily, with IFU instruments, we are starting to build up large samples that are allowing us to address some of the most pressing questions in um, AGN feedback studies. At low redshift, um, over the last um, decades, we have been building large galaxy samples, uh, also including AGN. This list of um, IFU galaxy surveys is not complete, but I am focusing here most um, specifically on the Manga survey, which is a low redshift IFU survey that has observed 10,000 galaxies in the local universe. And of course, among all these galaxies, we also have and find AGN. And um, having this access to the full 3D information allows us to build new AGN selection algorithms to select AGN in new ways. Um, this is what we did over the last um, couple of years in, in, a, in two papers, where we're really leveraging this additional parameter space that the IFU observations are providing us with. On the left-hand side of this, um, of, this, uh, of this slide, you see three galaxies that were observed within Manga. And the middle panels show you um, the 2D distribution of ionization signatures, of ionization diagnostics in each pixel um, that, um, that was observed within Manga. And then the pink and the yellow shaded regions show you the regions inside the galaxies that are consistent with strong contributions from an AGN in those galaxies. So you can see with, you know, having this additional a dimension, this additional spatial dimension, we can get a much more nuanced picture of AGN activity and AGN um, impact on gas even at large scales um, using this data set even in these low luminosity, low redshift AGN. So having um, accumulated this new sample or this um, updated sample of optically selected AGN, um, the manga data, the IFU data, then allows us to investigate the spatial, spatially resolved diagnostics of AGN feedback. And in particular, I want to show you um, a really nice um, plot where we're looking at the outflow strength um, parameterized by the velocity width of the O3 emission line in this case as a function of radius for AGN that were selected in different ways. So not just using optical diagnostics, but multi-wavelength diagnostics, really. Um, so the first thing that we note is that even low luminosity, low redshift AGN do show signatures for AGN outflows and winds out to the largest distances um, in basically in all cases. Um, we see this elevated um, velocity width across all radii. But what's really interesting is that um, we see a different behavior depending on the way that you select your AGN. 
Um, so that, of course, it also refers and uh, relates to the fact that AGN are different and that different selection techniques select um, AGN in different states. But that should, you know, make us very cautious about over-interpreting our results because the way you select your sample impacts quite a bit on what you will observe and what you will infer um, from your observations. And this is, I think, particularly to be kept in mind when we're moving to higher redshift sums where we don't have the statistics to build up comparisons like this. So indeed, um, moving to higher redshift, uh, a number of really tremendous um, and powerful instruments on ground-based observatories have really shaped, helped to shape our picture of AGN activity at and around Cosmic Noon. Um, again, this list of instruments here is not complete, um, but includes KMOS, Muse, Symphony and Eris on the VLT or KCWI on Keck. And over the years, um, sizable or good samples of galaxies at and around Cosmic Noon have started to build up that are, of course, not as large yet as the samples that we have at low redshift, but are really covering a good fraction of um, the galaxy population um, at these redshifts. To highlight one example from our group, um, we have observed um, redshift 3 radio loud AGN using the MUSE instrument and have been detecting giant Lyman Alpha nebulae around these AGN. With giant, I mean Lyman Alpha nebulae of the sizes of, um, in some cases, more than 100 kiloparsec scales across. Um, so you can see here, um, well, so-called, well, three color images of these nebulae where the colors, the different colors, refer to the different kinematic components of the Lyman Alpha emission line. Um, so this data set is really impressive, but because we have this spatial and spectral dimension, we can now go ahead and look into like, how the Lyman Alpha profile changes and varies across the nebula. So I want to show you here an example of what we've been finding. Um, so one of the first striking results is that whenever we look at the Lyman Alpha profile, across those nebula in around those radio loud AGN, we are finding significant absorption troughs in the Lyman alpha profile. So indicative of shells of gas that are absorbing the Lyman alpha emission in inside the galaxies, but also in the CGM of the galaxy, so the circumgalactic medium. So one of the endeavors that we're currently undertaking is to reconstruct the intrinsic underlying Lyman alpha emission to get the um, full and complete picture of what the size of the nebula and the surface brightness of these nebula are. But then we can also use the information that is encoded in the absorption um, of the Lyman Alpha Nebula and uh, try to find out more and get information about the gas that is actually responsible for these absorption troughs. And we can do this again in a spatially and a spectrally resolved manner. So here I'm showing you an example of um, one of these um, one of these analyses, where by modeling the absorption troughs, we can infer the column density of the observing gas, and we see a column density gradient here across the nebula that is about 40 kiloparsecs across. Um, we see the, in green overlaid the um, the contours of the radio jet. And in addition to just measuring the column density, we can also measure the velocity of that absorbing gas that is responsible for the absorption of the Lyman Alpha profile. And we see um, a velocity gradient that is actually consistent with the um, inclination or the uh, angle of the radio jet axis. So taking this information, but also information that is encoded in other emission lines that we have in the spectrum, we um, are starting to build up a more complete picture of what's happening in the CGM of these galaxies. In this case particular, we think that we are observing a, um, a large gaseous shell that has been ejected by a previous AGN or star formation rate episode. This shell, we see the absorption also in other lines. Um, we can infer, infer metallicity is metal enriched with almost solar metallicity. And it seems that the current AGN episode, the radio loud phase, is interacting with the gaseous shell um, 
leading to the slight velocity gradient that we do observe in the profile of the, um, of the absorbing structure. So with these, these observations are extremely complex and we've been only able to do um, a detailed analysis like this for one of the sources in our sample and we're currently working on also looking at the other sources. But that really shows the power of integral unit observations if we really not just you know, look at one specific wavelength range but take the full spectrum that is uh, encoded, the full spatial and spectral information, that can help us to start to build up a picture and to also look at the infect, impact of AGN not only on small scales, on galaxy scales, like I showed in the first part of my presentation, but also even on circumgalactic scales. And now, of course, JWST is the new kid on the block and is um, starting to um, complement our picture of AGN feedback in galaxies at and around cosmic noon with the amazing increased sensitivity. Um, to some extent, it's also giving us um, more high resolution observations at and around cosmic noon, but of course now pushes this whole game of investigating feedback signatures to the very high redshift regime. Um, and we are now able to basically look at feedback signatures using the same techniques and the same methods that we've been using at low redshift for decades. I won't have time um, to go into um, the observations that are happening currently at, at the very high redshift, but I want to focus here more on um, galaxies at and around cosmic noon from our early release science program Q3D. So Q3D was one of the first programs that was accepted to be executed with the JWST and we are using the near spec and MIRI IFUs so in the near and mid infrared opti uh, near and mid infrared to spatially resolve the kinematics of the multiphase wind in hand picked three hand picked um, selected quasars. Um, the first data for our highest redshift source came in last year this was on a Sunday. And I want to briefly walk you through some of the most exciting results that we've been getting from this, um, of this source. So back in 2017, when our proposal was accepted, it was a while ago, um, we knew that 1652, that's the name of the quasar, was an extremely red quasar, powerful AGN, dust obscured. We had a single slit spectrum that showed um, a broad component in the ionized gas profile signature of an AGN-driven outflow. We had some HST imaging that showed some extended emission um, that we interpreted with a possibly being related to a tidal uh, feature, but there was nothing much more, that, nothing more that we knew about the source. And then came 2022, um, our first near-spec cube came in, and I think we took two weeks just staring at this cube because the level of complexity and morphologies that we saw um, was just incredible and beyond anything that we could have imagined um, many years ago when we submitted that proposal. So in this case, I'm focusing now on just O3, knowing that the cube contains um, much more information. Um, we observe um, O3 emission across the entire near-spec data cube, which is about 25 by 25 kiloparsecs across. And depending on where you look into the cube, um, we see complex O3 kinematics with multiple components um, that are building up. And a very, many narrow and broad components that you can see here in um, the a small plots, sub-panels of this um, plot. The first results were also highlighted in a NASA and ESA press release and the teams did an amazing job in, in nicely visualizing what we saw in this complicated data cube. Um, so you can see here, um, just focusing on R3, the blue shifted emission that is consistent with the high velocity outflow coming out of the system, the systemic emission um, from the host galaxy, we see clumps of star formation here in the north, the red shifted component that is consistent basically with the back side of the outflow that is moving away, and then very redshifted emission um, with velocities of 800 kilometers per second that is actually uh, confirming the presence of three companion galaxies and um, confirming that this tidal fluffy um, emission that we saw in HST belongs to the system but is redshifted by 800 kilometers per second with respect to the quasar redshift. 
Um, so taking also into account um, other information that we have in the cube and um, uh, ionization diagnostics, we have been building up this picture where we probably have a quasar here in the center that is driving an outflow, um, a blue shifted outflow in the, in the south, red shifted counter cone in the north. We observe clumps of star formation in the north of the galaxy. We confirm the presence of three companions and the velocity and compactness of the region actually suggests that we are observing a, a proto-cluster information in this case. And we confirm the presence and the um, relation of this tidal structure to the system. But again, this is not at the same redshift as the quasar, um, but at, as the, the companion galaxies. What's also very interesting is that we're starting, we see signatures of shocks perpendicular to the outflow. And this is the first time in a high redshift quasar that we're seeing signatures of feedback beyond the um, illumination, the direct illumination of the quasar um, along the ionization cone. But we see shocks basically wrapping around obstacles in the host galaxy and impacting the host galaxy outside the ionization cone. Um, so you can see even with just this one data cube, we are starting to build up a tremendous complex um, picture and it will take some time to go through all the JWST data that are coming in over the next years to build up samples like we have at low redshift to really understand the specifics of feedback and the impact of AGN in these high redshift sources. Just briefly, the other two sources in our sample are also extremely interesting. Um, we see a powerful outflow in the Redshift 1.6 quasar. The AGN is completely dominating the photoionization signatures in the source. Um, the low Redshift um, AGN is, um, was also observed already in, in with MIRI. And signatures that we observe in the mid-infrared are directly relatable to ground-based observations. And it's um, amazing how well they agree. So we're starting to build up and identify new signatures in um, other wavelength regimes that can be used to look at AGN feedback signatures in the case where rest frame optical observations are not, um, are not accessible. Um, I think, well, <laughs> in my last minute, I want to advertise briefly our software tool that we're developing, Q3D Fit. We're hoping that it will be useful to the community. It's a PSF decomposition tool for your JWST cubes. For now, it is tailored to remove the quasar contribution um, um, of, to a host galaxy, but we're hoping um, that basically anyone who wants to subtract a PSF contribution from their underlying faint emission will be able to use this tool. So that leads me to my summary. Um, JWST gives us really an unprecedented view on the multi-phase gas at cosmic noon and beyond. AGN feedback is harder than we hoped and um, we thought. We observe complex kinematics, um, complex morphologies, low outflow masses in some cases, which is surprising. Um, we have to in take into account environmental effects. And I think we need to be starting to ask the question, what are really the signatures that we are, should be looking for to put these observations in the grand picture of you know, cosmic galaxy evolution. And I think we, I don't have a good answer to this question yet, but our community needs to be moving on and finding new ways of identifying um, the effect of feedback to galaxies across cosmic time. I want to end with the anniversary picture that came out um, four hours ago. Um, exactly one year ago today, JWST released its first science images. This is the anniversary picture of a star forming region inside our galaxy. Um, I'm leaving it here without saying much. You can read up on um, the amazing observations in the press release. And I also want to especially thank um, all the engineers, software engineers, technicians, all the people who are supporting the observatory satellites and instruments that we are using. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, congratulations on the results and award, the prize. Uh, we have time for a short question. Is there any that we could see? Yeah, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. I'm just uh, curious, you show this uh, one uh, high redshift source at, at redshift 3 and the tidal tail. 
And maybe I missed something. So do you have clear indications that it's of a tidal origin due to interaction or uh, could it potentially be due to some environmental effect like ram pressure stripping or uh, could you comment on that briefly, please? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, so we, we are not quite there yet in terms of our analysis. Um, it was very surprising to us that this tidal tail was not associated with the quasar itself, but more is more consistent with the host galaxies. Um, we do not observe a strong velocity gradient, um, so we don't really know how this tidal feature came there and maybe if one of the sources moved basically behind or in front of the quasar losing some of its material that we don't know yet. But we are working on getting um, observations on the larger field. So like I said, I th we think that we are observing the, the core of a protocluster and in fact the signatures are such that we are pretty confident that we are observing at least two dark matter halos that are currently in the process of merging explaining the large velocity offset of this tightly packed galaxies, um, but in the, over the next cycle we'll be getting spectroscopy of basically everything in the larger field of view that will then also allow us to um, identify other cluster members of or the same environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's thank Dominika again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we are uh, having the uh, uh, last talk of the series by the awardee of the uh, Merak Prize for the uh, best early career research in uh, new technologies in computational science. It's uh, uh, Dylan Nelson, and he will receive his prize by Lucho Mayor from the Merak Foundation. So the 2023 prize in the category new technologies, specifically computational, is awarded to Dylan Nelson for his leading role in computational astrophysics, in particular for the illustrious TNG series of cosmological simulations and his work to enable their widespread use. Congratulations, Dylan. Fantastic. So thank you very much for tech support, for taking us into full screen mode here. Uh, maybe we can also lower the blue lights on the screen a little bit. This is, of course, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, one of the most iconic images in extragalactic uh, astrophysics. Um, everything you can see, every smudge of light, uh, that you, almost every smudge of light is, of course, a, a galaxy in the distant universe. With one wrinkle here, uh, that this image is actually split down the middle. I don't know if you can tell. It's split exactly vertically down the middle, and while half is the real deep field, half is fake. So half is a synthetic or a mock deep field created from a cosmological hydrodynamical simulation called the Lustrous. And get ready, this is the interactive quiz portion of the talk. So take a look. What do you think? Is the left or the right real? So if you think the left half is real, give me, give me a hand. Raise your hand. Okay, don't be shy. 20%. If you think the right half is the real half, raise a hand. Interesting. If you think this is a trick question and it's all fake, raise your hand. Okay, that's not true. The left is real. Actually, giveaways are, say, artifacts like diffraction spikes on the stars, which we didn't add. So, before I jump in and tell you a bit more about these simulations, uh, I want to thank the Merrick Foundation for their support and um, uh, acknowledgement, recognition through this prize, which is fantastic. I want to tell you a little bit about illustrious TNG and our efforts to create virtual universes in a box on the supercomputer. Slightly more technical title would be uh, Numerical Simulations for Large-Scale Structure, Galaxy Formation, and Galaxy Evolution. So the questions we're asking here are some of the big ones. What is our universe made of and how does it evolve? And observationally, we have fantastic information on this from the early universe. This is, of course, the, the cosmic microwave background sky. And I'm showing you here statistics of these early universe fluctuations, the angular power spectrum. The data here in uh, blue is exquisitely fit by a theoretical model. The orange line, this is, of course, uh, lambda cold dark matter or lambda CDM, our standard model for cosmology. Uh, what does Lambda CDM gives us? It gives us our favorite pie chart in the world, right? Namely that the mass energy density of the universe is made up of unknown forms of dark matter, 25%, and dark energy, 70%. Pause there and think about that statement. We say it a lot, uh, but actually, Lambda CDM is an extraordinary idea. It places a huge burden on us to, to test 
Now, to test this theory and either validate it or falsify it by comparison to observational data. How do we do that? We need to know how structure, observable structure, evolves in the Lambda CDM universe. We've all seen schematic diagrams like the one on the right. What I like to say is that galaxy formation is an initial value problem. If we have very exquisite information about the initial conditions, which we do, we can then compute numerically the nonlinear outcome of the problem of structure formation by solving the relevant equations on a computer from early times through cosmic reionization into the late time evolved structure and eventually to redshift zero. And when we look out at redshift zero at the distribution of galaxies in the universe, this is what we see. So this is a, a light cone. The observer sits here, distance away from us, position on the sky. Galaxies are, of course, not distributed homogeneously. They, they cluster. They formed a cosmic web, filaments and voids. And what we've been able to do for at least 20 years now with simulations of only gravity is to reproduce this large-scale clustering of matter. This is a comparison of the 2DF survey on the top to the Millennium simulation from 2005 on the bottom. Um, but what I find fascinating about these images is actually that every point you see is, of course, not a point particle in space. It's an actual galaxy on the sky. Actual galaxies are extremely complicated. They come in this huge diversity of different shapes, different sizes, morphologies, colors, structural properties, star formation activities, and on and on. This is a tuning fork diagram from Spitzer. Uh, we also see them undergo really spectacular transformations in their life cycle. These are galaxy-galaxy major mergers from Hubble. And our goal here is to really understand and, and reproduce in, in numerical simulations this diversity of the galaxy population in its entirety. Uh, we do that by creating universe is in a box. So this is an example. This is the gas distribution on tens of megaparsec scales, tracing out filaments. As the, the view here shifts to actually show you isosurfaces of temperature, from 10 to the 4 Kelvin in blue to 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 Kelvin hot gas in, in red and orange. And as these two overlay on each other, you see that these hot heated, virilized regions of the universe are, of course, surrounding the nodes of the cosmic web. These are dark matter halos in the centers of which galaxies are, of course, forming. Good, so that gas is tracing the backbone of structure, which is dark matter. That's what I'm showing you here. And, and our goal within these, with these simulations is to adopt the assumption of Lambda CDM. And therein, what we're trying to do is to develop a theory for, for galaxy formation. We want to do that across the entire mass spectrum, basically uh, where galaxies exist, all the way from very small low-mass dwarf galaxies up to clusters, right? 10 to the 15 halos, the most massive objects in the universe. And we want to do it across all of cosmic time, again, where galaxies are observed to exist from the era of reionization down to the present day. Our tool of choice here are called cosmological hydrodynamical simulations. Cosmological means lambda CDM, initial conditions, and it also means not just single galaxies, but really large volumes for statistically representative populations of galaxies. Hydrodynamical means not just gravity and not just dark matter, but also the hydrodynamics of the gas, the stars, the supermassive black holes, and all of the messy baryonic physics which, which comes along for the ride. That gives us a lot of information in these kinds of simulations. Again, this is a visualization of dark matter on 100 megaparsec scales from top to bottom. This is a large filament of the cosmic web. On these scales, gas is tracing dark matter, uh, thanks to gravity. The motion of gas, this is the velocity field, is much more complicated, thanks in part to the feedback processes like we just heard about. Stars, of course, form where that gas gets dense enough and cold enough in the centers of dark matter halos in the centers of galaxies. It's a stellar density. The gas gets heated up, virilization, feedback heating. Of course, stars produce heavy elements. This is the metallicity, and those heavy elements get thrown out of halos and pollute the intergalactic medium, again, thanks to outflows and winds from galaxies. This is the Mach number of cosmic shocks. You see shocks tracing out the edges of large-scale filaments. This is the magnetic field strength at late time, which has become amplified due to turbulent dynamos from a very small initial seed field. And of course, observables. This is what this region might look like if you saw it with an X-ray telescope. Which is to say that these modern cosmological hydro simulations have enormous scope, and they can really connect to all kinds of different observational uh, regimes of interest. 
Again, let me come to the dark matter. Density field, 100 me megaparsecs, 300 million light years from left to right, which means that if you find the smallest little pink dot that you can in this image, that is a dark matter halo within which a Milky Way-like galaxy, like our own, would form. That means we have to zoom in a lot. So we have to zoom in all the way to maybe a single pixel on this image by a factor of 10,000 or so. If we do that, if we, we zoom in, this is what we find. So these are simulated galaxies from the TNG-50 simulation. These are stellar light mocks. They've been run through a dust radiative transfer code. That's why you see nice obscuration effects. There's all kinds of galaxies. No, there's disks, there's, there's bars, there's spiral features, there's mergers, ongoing interactions. There's bulges, there's spheroids, ellipticals. And again, not just one or a few galaxies, but really a lot, right? We're solving for the, the simultaneous co-evolution of thousands or tens of thousands of galaxies within one virtual universe. This is, I think, the, the first thousand most massive galaxies uh, from this simulation. And for every one of these galaxies, we have, a, we have a time machine, which is one of the most powerful ways that we use these simulations. So I want to show you how a galaxy, like our own Milky Way, forms. Uh, in one of these models. The main view we're looking at here is a gas density projection, and there's an inset of the stellar light on the bottom right. You can see the redshift in the upper right corner. We're passing redshift four now. It doesn't look much like a galaxy yet. So this is on the scale of the entire dark matter halo. This is what we think galaxy formation looks like at high redshift, very messy, very chaotic, very turbulent, lots of rapid accretion of gas from the intergalactic medium into these halos, a big ball of turbulent, messy gas. Eventually, though, things start to settle down. When we pass redshift two or so, you see what we're actually looking at as the gas kind of settles into a rotationally supported structure is, is an edge-on disk galaxy. You see it in the gas, you see it in the stars. You see lots of accretion still coming in. You see a merger there, a little minor merger, about to come in and, and torque this disk around, perturb it, actually, cause the formation of a bar structure, which you can see in the stars, rather clearly starting to just spin around. And as this galaxy slowly evolves past redshift one down to redshift zero, it's, it's quiet, it's in isolation more or less. You see the baryon cycle in action. You see material going out. This is mainly blown by supernova feedback going off, galactic scale winds, and recycling that same material falling back onto the galaxy in the form of clumps and streams of colder gas. This galaxy, as, yeah, as we approach redshift zero, is just kind of rotating around, nicely bubbling away, star formation rate of one, one solar mass per year or so, kind of like our own Milky Way. So the challenge in these kinds of simulations is, of course, they're very physics rich with gravity. There's hydrodynamics. Maybe you also need to worry about chemistry, radiation, cosmic rays, magnetic fields. The list goes on. It's also very multi-scale, which means there's a huge dynamic range in, in space and time. And I like to show that with this kind of image, starting from really gigaparsec scales on the bottom. This is where the, the universe approaches uh, homogeneity, right, and iso isotropy. And we have to zoom in by a factor of a thousand to megaparsec scales, where you see individual dark matter halos, uh, individual collapsed structures. Again, by a factor of a thousand, to get to kiloparsec scales, right, where you actually have galaxies. Uh, fortunately, we're not done yet then. You have at least another factor of a million, right, to get to scales of astrophysical interest where stars form, where accretion disks around supermassive black holes form. And the issue here is not just information propagating from large to small scales, there's also a back reaction. And a, and a relativistic jet, like sh that one shown here, is a great example of that. Right, launched from a very small region, we know that such a jet, though, can impact the intracluster medium of an entire cluster on scales of a billion times larger. So the, capturing this uh, range, this dynamic range, is the challenge of modern cosmological simulations. Our most recent attempt to do that is what we call a lustrous TNG. So let me acknowledge the, the group of collaborators here. This is a lot of work by actually a rather small group of people. In particular, uh, Volker Springel in Munich and Annalisa Pilpich in uh, Heidelberg, uh, without which, of course, this project would not exist. So a lustrous TNG, this is, I call it the family picture. It's a suite of three cosmological simulations, TNG 50, TNG 100, TNG 300. The names, the numbers and the names are rather unimaginative. They just tell you the extent the size of the boxes in co-moving omega parsecs. So each of these three simulations is run with the same physical model for galaxy formation. They just have different focuses. The big volume looking at clusters and rare objects, the small volume looking at the detailed internal properties of galaxies. 
what illustrative change it gives us, of course, it gives us one view on how the universe could have evolved. Uh, I want to show it to you here. Look at the upper left. These are the density fields, gas and dark matter. They started perfectly smooth, right? But very rapidly, little inhomogeneities, little overdensities started to accelerate collapse and, and structure form. So we're looking at the gas density in the upper left, the dark matter density. The next panel over, the stellar density where stars are forming inside of halos. This is eight views on the same region of space, 10 megaparsecs across, evolving towards redshift zero. The lower left, we have the gas temperature. You see heating around collapsed structures. You see outflows extending to really megaparsec scales away from large dark matter halos. You see the metals here, metallicity, produced inside of stars, of course, inside the very cores of galaxies, again, getting ejected into the intergalactic medium. You see the magnetic field strength on the upper right, started with a vanishingly small primordial seed field and has been amplified across time. We see the gas velocity field, a bit boring, but when you look, sometimes you see outflows, you see motion fighting against gravity. The lower right, you see quintuply ionized ions of oxygen. This may seem a bit strange to you, but an ultraviolet tracer observational of the gas around galaxies. So we can go into these simulations. We can do all kinds of things with them. We can find analogs of unique objects. So this is M104, the real M104, the Sombrero Galaxy, and five serendipitous analogs pulled out of the simulation. Then you can go and ask, of course, how do they form? What, what makes them unique? Do the same with mergers. So on the top row, four real mergers, galaxy-galaxy major mergers, and on the bottom, again, a random selection of kind of serendipitously found mergers with similar morphologies from the simulation. A last example, fine-grained structure, stellar streams, stellar shells in the extended stellar halos of galaxies. One real example and five, of course, simulated analogs. Those are all visible. We also see the invisible universe. So this is a merger between two galaxy groups, which is going to form a cluster. In, in yellow, you see the stars, but in blue, between these two components, you see a bridge of dark matter. I call this the fireball image. This is a galaxy cluster, 10 to the 15 solar masses. The color is actually showing you the velocity, and this cluster is being fed by three very turbulent streams of gas from the intergalactic medium. This image I like a lot. This is from the original Lustre simulation. It shows you the connection between gravity and feedback processes. The dark matter skeleton is in blue, but in orange you see the velocity field of the gas. You see active galactic nuclei, as we were just hearing about, launching very fast outflows away from galaxies. People like this image so much, they put it on a stamp of the Deutsche Post. So if you want to send mail, you can do so with a cosmological simulation. So, Visualization is not all we do. Of course, visualization is cr critical for outreach. It's also critical for scientific exploration, actually, to understanding what is in these large simulations. But ultimately, what the simulations enable are quantitative, very quantitative comparisons with data. And I want to give you just two small examples of that. The first is the galaxy stellar mass function. So this is the most basic, the most fundamental statistic of the galaxy population. It's just a histogram. A count of number of galaxies as a function of their mass. Of course, there's lots of little galaxies and not many big galaxies. All the gray is data from the low redshift universe, redshift zero from, from Sloan and Gamma. The colored curves are three models, right? So the, the red curve is the older generation of these models, the original illustrious simulation. The blue curve, you see the updated TNG model and the improvement in the agreement between the simulated and observed galaxy stellar mass functions. The galaxy colors are also a great example. So this is, again, just a histogram, a PDF of galaxy color. Uh, in gray, you see SDSS, right? And again, in red, you see a previous generation of models. In blue, the newer models where only recently have we been able to uh, reproduce quantitatively the, the bimodality seen in the galaxy color distribution. Of course, on the left, this peak is from blue galaxies, young low mass star forming galaxies on the right, you have the peak from the red galaxy population, quiescent stop forming stars. This dichotomy and the ability of these models to reproduce the kind of heter heterogeneity of the galaxy population is actually one of the, the key successes in, in recent years. Good, so Lustre TNG is not the only cosmological hydro simulation on the market. There's lots of them. You've undoubtedly heard names like Magneticum, Eagle, Horizon AGN. 
in, in orange and all the ones I visualized here are actually those which are publicly available. So you can go, you can download them, you can play with them, you can use them for your science. They have a lot of common ingredients. They all include dark matter, cold dark matter, gas, stars, supermassive black holes, and now sometimes also magnetic fields. So they have a, a huge amount of information. I like to ask the question sometimes, well, so what physical properties, what physics can you actually get at with these simulations? And the answer is almost everything you can imagine. Right, so gas temperature, density, metallicity, ionization, metal abundances, cooling properties, absorption, emission, kinematics, stars, masses, ages, star formation, histories, light, dust, okay, not really, dispersion measure, rotation measure, SZ, FRBs, H1, black holes, dark matter. All of this in the resolved sense, on that one kiloparsec scale, in and around galaxies. So all these properties, you also know them in connection to the galaxies and the halos within which this matter exists. So the stellar masses, the gas contents, sizes, morphologies, morphological properties, star formation or histories, colors, spin, whatever you want. So I just put up a giant list, right, just to maybe so you see something you like. You see something which connects to what you, uh, in particular, do in your science. And as you can imagine, that's a lot of data. We're really into the big data era here. That's why I like to show a table of numbers. These three illustrious TNG simulations are the three columns. And volume at the top, bigger is better. Volume means statistics, means rare objects. The number of particles, the number of resolutions, elements in these simulations is now between 10 billion and 100 billion, just to get a number. We quantify the resolution in terms of the mass resolution. So it's like 10 to the six, that's how much mass, solar masses a single stellar particle has to represent. Maybe easier to connect to the spatial resolution. We often say that these simulations in parsecs, we often say they have a resolution of about one kiloparsec to keep a number in mind. Big data, I like to add some numbers. So a single snapshot is maybe a few terabytes. We save of order 100 snapshots. It means a single simulation like this takes a few hundred terabytes and a total project is about one petabyte of data, uh, which we've made a very concerted effort to make actually publicly available in its entirety. And in part, the Merrick Prize is in recognition of this uh, effort to make this data really public and really accessible. So if you've never seen the website or taken a look at the data, I encourage you to check it out. I want to show it to you in the next uh, three minutes, really briefly. So we've created a, a data platform or a science platform, if you like a, a buzzword, which lets people explore, search, visualize, analyze, download the data. There's a, a Google Maps kind of explorer. You can zoom around, you can compare the gas, the dark matter, the stars. You can interactively explore merger trees, so the assembly history, how a galaxy, how its progenitors came together over time. You can explore in 3D the, the spatial distribution of objects, of halos, of galaxies. You can volume render through the gas. You can, of course, search through the catalogs. You can plot from the catalogs. It may sound a bit boring, but when you can plot anything versus anything else, it's actually a very powerful explore, exploration tool. So galaxy-specific star formation rate, just as an example, versus galaxy stellar mass, colored by anything else you might imagine. In this case, gas phase metallicity. You see the main sequence, you see the drop off to the quiescent population, maybe you see secondary correlations with metallicity. You can also visualize galaxies and halos. You can make a picture of the molecular hydrogen column density of a galaxy or of every galaxy, and not just a picture, you can also access the data behind these visualizations. Column density, for example. We've also recently introduced that Jupyter Lab interface. I'm sure everyone is familiar with this. This is the philosophy, bring your code to the data. This means that instead of downloading lots of data, people can go online, connect through their browser to a, a containerized instance, not in the cloud, but actually on the supercomputer where the data is. You can run your Python, your Julia, your R, your MATLAB, IDL, C++, whatever you like. Doesn't matter. It's actually a very powerful way to interact with the data. This effort has seen a lot of um, interest, a lot of use. I want to show you a few statistics versus time. Ever since 2015, eight years ago, when we released the original illustrious simulation. So now there's almost 8,000 registered users for this service. They've made 800 million API requests. Maybe that's about one day for Twitter, but for us, that is a lot, I assure you. Much more important than that, the red line here is the number of actually active users, people who actually are interacting with the data on a, on a monthly basis, just steady state, 300, 400 people. 
900 people, the blue line, have registered for this lab service, 28,000 uh, analysis sessions launched to date. It's really big data, so in the orange and the green, tens of thousands of snapshots and catalogs downloaded. The purple number, 28,000, that's terabytes, so tens of petabytes of data transferred. Probably most important, of course, people actually use the data to do science. They do science and they write papers. 230 papers written about the original illustrious simulation, over 650 papers written about the illustrious TNG simulations alone, and 99% of them are using this infrastructure of the data release. So I'm a bit biased, but I think this is really a field-leading example of open data and open science in theoretical astrophysics, really enabling a really broad investigation into many different topics. So let me wrap up. Universe is in a box. These cosmological hydrodynamical simulations let us uh, predict, let us derive the outcome of our Lambda CDM idea. The outcomes are synthetic universes which are quantitatively comparable to the real universe, and we can use them to explore the astrophysics of galaxies and large-scale structure, gas physics, stellar properties, feedback, dark matter, black holes, AGN, magnetic fields, and a lot more. The, these public data sets are very large and I think very useful for a range of questions. So your homework, your take-home assignment, or the audience is to think about how these types of simulations can be applied to your uh, particular science. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So uh, we can now start with uh, taking questions from the audience. If there are any, please raise. Oh, there is one in the middle. Up there, I managed to see at least one hand during the full session. Hi, uh, thank you very much for this nice talk. It is impressive everything that one can achieve with this kind of simulations. So um, I was very curious about the, the, what you showed uh, regarding the serendipitous analogues. So um, uh, my first question is how can you find among uh, these thousands of simulated galaxies uh, one that is closest to, the, to a, a given object? And well, a question that is a bit related to this, uh, also regarding the formation of galaxies, what do this uh, model tell us about the um, uh, frequency of, of supermassive binary black holes? Is it something that, that we can, uh, well, guess from the simulations? Thank you. So. Um, the analogs I showed, that's an example of old school, of visual classification by humans. Of course, maybe in the future that's something for a machine learning to take over, to find uh, specific cases which look like something you're interested in in particular. Those were just by hand, right, by eye. Look through a few thousand, as people have done also for real galaxies, and pick out objects of interest. Um, in terms of, you asked about binary supermassive black holes. So that's really a question that depends on which simulation you're talking about. So for example, in the illustrious TNG simulations, which I've been uh, mostly involved in, the, the model for the motion, the dynamics of supermassive black holes is extremely simple. We do something which is called pinning to the potential minimum, which means that the motion of supermassive black holes, they're basically stuck in the center of their galaxies. And so when you have a merger coming in, it's a very prompt event. As soon as they get close enough, they have to merge. This is just a limitation, one of many of the simulations. There's other simulations, more recent, which have started to relax this assumption, started to try to follow the dynamics of black holes more faithfully, and this would allow you, perhaps, to resolve a bit of the binary phase uh, when they're coming together. But it's certainly, it's, it's a hot uh, recent topic, uh, which you could maybe access in certain uh, modern and, and future simulations. Thank you. Uh, was there a question just behind or was that no? So are there other questions in the audience? I'm sorry if I don't see them. Um, maybe, oh, there is one on, the, on, the, on that side, yeah, up there. Sorry. Very nice talk, Dylan. Um, what's next? What's your next big project? What, what we are going to expect from simulations? Like bigger boxes, smaller particles, or? In terms of the simulations themselves? Yes. After I think the, TNG. The field is really moving in two simultaneous directions. One is bigger and one is smaller. So bigger means we have models which are fairly uh, working quite well but we can't realize their outcome in the most extreme environments for example in the most rare and massive clusters 
So there's a lot of recent projects um, which are simulating with hydrodynamics enormous volumes. Also, you have cosmological applications there. So that's one direction. The other direction is smaller, which is perhaps more exciting um, to a lot of us. So smaller means you're going to ultra high resolution, pushing down to resolution, approaching one parsec. This gives you the opportunity, but also the burden of, of increasing the sophistication of the models significantly. You can do, start to do things like resolve the colder phases of the interstellar medium or resolve the interaction of supernova feedback and supermassive black hole feedback with that interstellar medium in much more direct and much more realistic ways. Um, so these two directions, I think, simultaneously are the, are the future. Thank you. Are there other questions uh, in the audience? I don't see a question. Can I ask a question? Of My pri privilege. I would like to, you to, to, to share with us your, your thought on the, um, on the future, let's say, um, challenges and also uh, solutions for the, for the large uh, cosmological simulations. Some people are mentioning the use of uh, machine learning to accelerate or to emulate or to uh, so somehow. And the second aspect is re with respect to the um, sustainability of the activity in terms of the codes themselves, the, um, the, I mean, the computers themselves, etc. if you want to share. Thank you. So the first question is about the application of machine learning in general and these kinds. There's two, again, two areas people are very excited about. First is you could actually imagine machine learning based models inside the simulations. It's quite exciting. So, of course, there's always limits to what they can do. At very small scales, you have unresolved phenomena. So perhaps there, where now we have very phenomenological models, you could replace some of that with machine learning models running during the simulation which have been trained on, say, even higher resolution uh, simulations, for example. The other aspect, of course, is in the analysis and interpretation of these simulations, which is just a, a mammoth task sometimes. Um, the sustainability is, of course, on our minds. So, so the TNG-50 simulation was the largest of the ones I showed. It took 100 million CPU core hours to run, uh, which is a lot. That's uh, 16,000 cores 24-7 for one year straight. And in fact, astrophysics is a large user of high-performance computing uh, facilities. But this is on the minds of all big supercomputer centers these days. So you're typically getting uh, energy reports um, when you're doing large calculations. And of course, it's up to those centers to source electricity from green uh, sources and be transparent about that. And they are moving in that direction very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation and the talks. Uh, so I think that we're coming to the end of this session. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the awardees of the prizes once again. <laughs> and, and I will ask you another round of applauses for, in fact, the four presentations, very inspiring of this afternoon. Also for the, uh, for, uh, the uh, volunteers and the technical staff who made this, uh, this session so smooth. So thank you for all of them. Thank you.